Welcome to another Zoom. We're coming to you today, at least my guest, from Arlington Heights, Illinois, an area that I know a lot about. And we have a special guest, Lena Abujamar. I probably butchered the name, but she was born in Beirut, Lebanon. And let me just tell you a little about her before you meet her. Beautiful girl, single. <laughs> observe, folks. Uh, she, Alina, is uh, uh, her latest book, by the way, Frac "Fractured Faith." This is this is why we're talking. It is a well written, a subject that many of you probably will have experienced. It's kind of a biography of what happened in her life and then how she has been used of the Lord in such a phenomenal way and she is brilliant that means this thing right here God blessed her abundantly but let me just tell you a little about her she she is also does a telemedicine and so I guess that means you can she'll have to tell us what it what it means but I guess that means if I have a problem I can call her and say this is my problem what should I do and she will give me some kind of a answer. So uh, she's founder of Living with Power Ministry. So she's she's just blessed in so many areas. Uh, uh, she is uh, like I say, she was born in in Beirut, Lebanon. I, I said born there, so I'm going to have to find out if that's correct. Uh, and so she understands that beautiful. It used to be called the Pearl mm -hmm. of that part of the world. And it was it would be like kind of kind of like some of the foreign countries that are just gorgeous. And that's the way Beirut, Lebanon is. And when tragedy happened, it was just so sad. Uh, she speaks fluently Arabic and uh, she has, has has also been. I don't know if she continues. She's a pediatric uh, ER doctor. So she's seen every kind of situation. Uh, her, her book. Fractured Faith uh, resulted because of her church scandal ridden, uh, created a crisis for her faith. And she's going to tell us about how all of that happened. Lena, welcome to this Zoom today, all the way from Arlington Heights, Illinois. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I feel like I'm with you in person. <laughs> yeah. Now, now how, how did you decide you wanted to be a ER doctor, I mean, and a pediatric. Right. Yeah, much to the dismay of my father, who was a surgeon. And if you know anything about the medical world, surgeons don't love the ER. They want things in a controlled setting. And the ER is, is the opposite of that. You know, I, I, we, I grew up in Lebanon, as you mentioned. So I, I was born in Beirut. Both my parents are, uh, actually, my dad is Lebanese. My mom lived her whole life in Lebanon, but came from Israel. She was Palestinian refugee, interestingly, but her dad was a pharmacist. So they had some stability and, you know, to be able to start a new life in Lebanon. And so she eventually met my father, married him, and she was a pharmacist. He was a surgeon. They actually met through her work uh, and whatnot. And she had become a Christian. And so she brought us up in the church and in a missionary alliance church, much like uh, my background, really similar to what would be a, a Sunday school background here. In fact, the that, missionary. That's a, that's a great. That's a great movement. Oh sure, and the pastor and his wife were amazing. They must have been a hundred years old when I was ten, and, I, and then they lived another twenty years, and then eventually passed away in Kissimmee, Florida. But really, amazing people. They had had a career in Cambodia and then went to Lebanon. Anyway, we came to Christ as I came to Christ as a child, and then my my dad eventually believed. But I, you know, we, we, Lebanese families bring up their kids if they have the ability to educate them with very high standards of like you need to go all the way in school. And so it doesn't suffice to just go to college. They want you to be a professional. And some of it is the background of war and of course the economic instability and all the things. And so there's a big push to equip their kids to be able to handle whatever comes. And so many of the Lebanese you'll meet in the United States are very accomplished and ambitious. And I think it, it's driven from a background of destruction and war and not having. And so we were given a lot of that privilege because my dad had become a doctor through the generosity 
generosity of an uncle who years before had emigrated to Charlottesville, West Virginia, of all places. Wow. And so he kind of understood how to, you know, come from nothing and to become a plastic surgeon at, at that. And so had trained at the Mayo Clinic. And so he, you know, we, we, I think I, I started college thinking, I guess I would do medicine. It was sort of expected in the family. And, and then I did well in it. And I kept doing well in it and eventually thought I would either be a surgeon or a pediatrician. And long story short, I decided to do the easier three year because I thought maybe God wanted me to be a missionary. And I thought I would get into the mission field faster. Well, the irony was that at the end of that three years, I'd gone engaged, broken off the engagement, decided I didn't like pediatrics and by God's grace, loved the ER. So then I did three more years of training in pediatric ER wow. and I practiced for about 17 years until I did full-time telemedicine. You might, we brought that up and it's of course now with COVID, a lot of people are familiar with it, but what you described is exactly that. You call and I fix your problems and it's very rewarding. I do it in five minutes or less and you know, 90% of the time, there's about 10% that doesn't get fixed over the phone and you have to send them in or there's you know some stalemate of them wanting something and you can't do it and you try to negotiate that but it really it is a it is a very efficient way of doing medicine and in a world where we value efficiency you know of course for me the gift has been that as i transitioned from the er and by the way once you're a pediatric er doctor you're always a pediatric er doctor of course we keep up with their certification and all of that but as i as i um, have walked through the last few years writing the book fractured faith in fact i talk a little bit about the journey in the book a uh, part of the story was that God used the season of transition and really great struggle to bring out an aspect of our ministry that was a bit dormant. I was doing a lot of medical mission trips up to that point, but never thought that we would establish a, pr a stable presence in a country where we were helping in the same place, growing the work, sort of setting up a global work. And that's what happened in 2015 after the Syrian refugee crisis started in the uh, 12, 13. We started going there because I was in a season of life where I was asking like, what am I supposed to do now? Because I used to serve in the church and now I'm not in the church. And, and through that pain, I ended up doing work. Uh, and now we do uh, we have a, an amazing medical program in Lebanon, and we're helping the Ukrainian refugees. And so it became hard to be in the ER. So I, I by you, God, you God, actually you actually raise funds, right, to help. So we do everything. Yeah. So we basically so the ministry started. So I run a ministry called Living with Power Ministries. I started it really Bible teaching. So initially, started creating resources for Bible study, writing, started writing books. As you mentioned, I've had a couple of books, but I think this is my fourth book. Moody Publishers found me. They asked me to write on singleness. And then I wrote a couple other books and now Fractured Faith. And, and so I never thought I was going to do ministry also overseas. I just assumed this is what God wants. And I think be careful anytime you assume anything about God, because God has another plan that he's brewing that is bigger and better than you might imagine, right? Yeah. But it's only when you yield control, and, and most of us never yield control. We're holding on tight. And it's only when you yield control that things actually start to play out. Alina, you, 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 you had an, a very traumatic experience because yeah. you were you were in a large church in Chicago. Yeah. One is called a mega church. Yep. And, and I, I know because of your personality and your intellect, you have been blessed so much with with what the, God has given you in this talent uh, of going to school and yeah and, and graduating tops and, and then going into a field that most people only hear about or dream about. But but obviously you were very close to the pastor and his wife. Mm -hmm. And kind of tell us that because yeah, you felt that you were kind of like in that cocoon, yeah, where everything yeah. was okay, right? Yeah, and like more than okay. So yeah, so basically, and and I think I, I referenced something that is worth bringing up as background, which is uh, in my res in my fellowship, I went through a crisis of faith. It was smaller, and it had to do with my personal life, and I think that's relevant because it gave so much more power and strength to what I saw then as my calling. So I felt called to teach the Bible right coming out of this end of the single story. I, I was I, the guy I thought I would marry, not the guy I was engaged with, but another best friend of mine. I thought God was going to return that into who, who I would marry. And of course, that didn't come to fruition. And because of that, I felt God had let me down. And as I worked through that, we all expect some difficulty in the Christian life. And it took a while, six months, a year, maybe more to work through it, at least at the beginning level of working through it. And out of that experience, I felt called to teach the Bible. Long story, but that was the end result. 
And I was so, so sure of that calling. By the time I moved to Chicago a couple of years later, I was, everything I was doing revolved around that, about pursuing God's plan for my life. I was in a hundred percent. It wasn't a, an average Christian. I was all in already. People at my work knew I had a, started a website, blogging, all the things. That, that's kind of and your I, personality. Right. That's right. I'm an ER doctor through and through. This is, it's in my DNA. And so I, I was sort of approaching this thing, like looking for the right church. And I started going to that church and, and over the course of two or three years, they did not have a campus by the city. I was living downtown Chicago. And every few months I would call. This is back in 2000. No one had campus ministries. We were still mega church, one location. But I would call and ask, hey, is there a possibility? Have you opened another branch? I don't even know why I would call. And eventually they said, yes, we'd open another branch. I started going there, drove 30 minutes to the church, but it was worth it. And I felt, why is that important? Because people always talk about church hurt being such a big deal. And it is because so many of our dreams and aspirations as Christians end up coming together in this local church where, where you know God's wired you with gifts and you see those gifts and calling. And the more you're in tune to your calling, the more importance that community be, that becomes for you. And when you find a church that was thriving, amazing, you feel like like God is answering all of your prayers. And, for, and especially as a single woman, after I had said, you know, the, the stuff fell apart. And now I thought, well, God wants me to be single. My, my book on singleness is called Thrive. So, yeah. you know, I felt like I was thriving, living God's call for my life. And so for years, and then I saw God move. And even this passage of going from a simple member to becoming on the inner circle, which, you know, people who follow a lot of mega church movements, it's not necessarily healthy, but it's a fact that in those environments where the pastor becomes a celebrity, there is this tiered approach. And somehow I was in that close circle by how God worked that out. I don't know. And and I, and I know so because I've just met you. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, it was a privilege, but it was all like it was it almost seemed too good to be true because the pastor was that great in the eyes of man, which in and of itself, one has to watch out when we have these characteristics to the pastorate. Nonetheless, all these things now we're more aware of, I think, than we were 20 years ago. But in that process, we started seeing, in fact, there were people, elders and eventually people in the church who started seeing these patterns that were not consistent with a biblical character and started talking about them. And over the course of a couple of years, things started brewing. And then the next couple of years, it became serious enough to where you started seeing, you know, groups of people leave. Well, I was an insider and I would always try to get the other side of the story. And I felt like there was always justification. And so for two or three years, you walk this walk in a church where on one hand, it's everything you want it to be. On the other hand, you start seeing some major holes in it. And you start to question, am I crazy? Or is what's ha you, you can't quite decipher what's happening. And you, you go from giving them the benefit of the doubt to really saying, there's something in my spirit that doesn't sit well, to the point where by 2013, and I had led the women's ministry for three years, so and I was working in the ER at the same time. So I was running this whole thing, but I could see that there was something wrong. And I eventually left in 2013. And and. And, and because after, after all of that, because I'm trying to, yeah, I want to get as much right. as I can in. After all of that, you, you talk about my faith began a slow yeah. deconstruction. Yes. So, and and this is what led to it. So, so, so again, you you have so much hope in the church, which is not bad, but but our hope should be in Jesus. Yes. You got, you got to be at pay attention, and those are some things I talk about in the book. But I. When I left, even though I left, I, you know, I think this is the mind game that happens. You leave for noble reasons. There was, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't get in a fight with anyone. I leave for noble reasons led by the spirit. So I assume God is just going to show that I'm right. Yes. <laughs> it's going to topple. Something is going to happen in the next month to prove, or at least you expect that your friends from that church, which was your world, because we've, so, we're so serious about our faith at that point that this is your social structure. This is your world. I'm not dating. I don't socialize at work because they're doing things I don't want to do as a Christian. So yeah. you lose your world, but you never anticipate that they're going to turn their back on you. But now remember, it turns into an us against them. So yes. on the inside, they're looking at everyone who's left as in them. Yes. They're equal. They're yes. left. They're breaking unity. And you're kind of going, wait, I didn't even do anything here. So this is when you start questioning first the leadership, then your friends. And eventually the buck stops with God because you know, in your soul, you go, why hasn't God intervened? Yeah. Since he yeah. was the one who led me. And that I believe is where your faith. In fact, one of your chapters is where is God in my pain? 
That's right. That's my first chapter. Yeah. And that's the first question you ask because you start, you're hurting in that season. I remember going through that. The first six months were okay because I kept thinking God would show up and God didn't. And I think when people talk about the dark night of the soul, it's that sense of God, where are you? I can't hear you. I can't see you clearly. And it got worse after the first six months because I, I kept thinking, all right, God wants us to wait. God's going to do something. I just need to be patient. And, and then you start seeing how it impacts your ministry, whether you don't stop getting invited to speak. Yeah. I had two books come out in that season, that very first year. And you start seeing that there's there's not a lot of movement on that. So what you were hoping would happen doesn't. And so a lot of the things that maybe you were hoping would happen, even in hindsight, I think, I mean, no one has promised a best-selling book. No one has promised a big ministry. I mean, there are people who spend their life in ministry washing dishes. Maybe they wanted to be authors. and they don't. So it's a privilege already to write books, but you can't see that. All you can see is the injustice of right. God. Why are they winning? Because in the meantime, the church kept growing for a while. Why do they look like they're winning and I'm not? And, and the mind game, so everyone talks about Psalm 73. And if you're a Christian and you're watching, you know, Psalm 73 is about this uh, man who wrote the Psalm, who's looking at the unsaved world, the non-Christian going, man, it's not right. How come they're succeeding and I'm not? And in that context, we, you know, the, the punchline in the Psalm is that wait, because they're, they're not Christians and, and God has it, has it coming. Be patient, go to the house of God. Well, when you're fighting other Christians or when there's, when there's conflict with other Christians, it becomes a mind game because you start to wonder, wait, I'm a Christian and they're a Christian and they look like they're winning and I'm not. So what does that mean? Does that mean I'm not a Christian or does that mean I'm a bad Christian? And so all of these mind games, and then you know how it is in that season when you're asking these questions and you're not leaning on God's goodness in it because you're now separated from God because you're doubting him, you start finding comfort in things that typically are sinful in some form or fashion. And it doesn't have to be, you know, but never, you have to be like drug, sex, and rock and roll. It can, it can be, it can sometimes be good things, things that numb your pain. People go to the gym excessively can be a bad thing if it's replacing God as the source of your comfort. These are your words, but, and I think they're fabulous. I, I wrote it down. God's goodness is meant to be received in the midst of our pain, not proven by the absence of our pain. That's right. I mean, excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, honestly, what, as a writer and, and a Bible teacher, I think so many of those types of sentences, God just gives you the words for them. They, I mean, I don't think any of things we write are div divinely inspired in the sense of scripture, but I really think that that when God calls you to something, whether it's to you know, run a radio or TV show or whether it's, you know, whatever it is, I think God equips you to say the right thing. And, and Fractured Faith in particular has been a book that was born out of a lot of pain that somehow I was able to express some of those ideas that I think a lot of people connect with. And, and I think this, what the sentence you just read, I mean, I think this is sort of at the heart of, of our Christian life. Even I look back as I walk through the church disillusionment, disappointment, you could even use the term now deconstruction, which is a very popular term in 2022. Yes. What, what that means to me, deconstruction at this point, we can break it down and go through, you know, the academic definitions and all that. But really what it means to me, you deconstruct when you become very disillusioned first with what your life is but where you turn it and you're disillusioned with the system of belief or in the case of a Christian with God, God, you promised this, but why is my life like this? God, I did my part. Why doesn't it look like you're doing yours? And as I lived the church hurt, I found that there were a lot of things about prior disappointments that weren't fully dealt with that I had just patched up in order to move on. In and fact, so Lena, yeah, one of your close friends raised a Christian, went to Christian colleges and everything. She left the faith. Well, the, those stories are a dime a dozen now, sadly, but that one impacted me because we went to a Christian college and she was one of my best friends in college and and she was hurt because her husband had an affair and she had four boys and she ended up, um, yeah, she doesn't believe in anything now. So and she, she, she again, yeah, she, in fact, she says, where was God in my pain? So she left. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think pain, you know, God speaks loudly in pain, but I think people have really one of two responses to pain. It either turns them from God or, or it turns them to God. And I think that's a fascinating question. I don't know that I have a perfect answer. What's the difference between one or the other? You can talk to people with theological answers about God's predestination and sovereignty. I don't know. All I know is if you have tasted the goodness of God, yeah. you cannot help but be changed by it. Even after seasons like the prodigal son, I referenced that analogy multiple times in the book, just like the prodigal, he knew as bad as the pigsty got, 
that there was a father waiting for him with open arms. And, yes. and to me, this is the tipping point. This is really the story of fractured faith. It wasn't a story of, you know, people always want to know, well, how'd you get out of it? How'd you get out of it? Yeah. What are the three steps I need to do? How do I get my kids? A lot of parents will ask this because there's really the generational deconstruction is happening in the millennials. So a lot of my age now, I'm I'm hitting that second half of life where, where m- my friends and, and they have kids who are going through this and they want to know how do I, what do I tell them to do? What do I do? And I always... I'm so hesitant because it's. It, to, to, I want to tell people like there is no three step process to this. Right. This is a live relationship. Right. Our God is not just a set of beliefs. He is a. He is. He's a spirit that you can commune with and talk to. And and you. I, I'm less now believing. You know, I used to think you got to get people the truth. You got to change them. And and I found that you really can't. You can't. But but God doesn't need us to. He really right. doesn't. You're right. If he's there, if he's real, if he's love, he's going to do the job. So what we need to do is entrust our worries to him and open our love to others. In fact, you, you, in your book, you bring up Naomi. Yes. Naomi. Yes. Good job. You read a lot of it. I'm impressed, right? But yes, I, I love the story of Ruth and Naomi because this if there is a story in the Bible that that capsules yeah. practice paper story Naomi and Naomi was in the bottom pit she said she even changed her name to Mara yeah. bitter and she was so broken and her salvation came through Ruth the most unexpected Moabite really you could say through Boaz but really it's it's two you can look at it from both perspectives but but this unexpected woman who could have left maybe should have left she had no hope of getting married again with her mother-in-law who was a bitter mother-in-law it was hard enough to have a mother-in-law but this is a mother-in-law who was bitter at this point of life and she yeah. she persevered with her and i think you see later how god in his grace and in his goodness used the least likely person yeah. to woo naomi back to him and at the end of the story of, of Ruth, three pages it's worth reading you you get to this place where naomi's laughing with joy how does that happen outside of the goodness of god it's impossible. I I, lo- I love the fact that you you also allude to uh, Warren Wiersbe, and and yeah. he, he he would he pastored Moody Church. He did yeah. I saw his be remember those books be confident be humble yeah, yeah. the whole series so good right. And these are the words that you put in your book. Truth without love is brutality, and love without truth is hypocrisy. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah, it's the truth. It really is. And I think to walk that fine line between love and truth, I think is really the challenge of this era right now for Christians. I think I think we see groups of Christians who bend towards the truth and it's very hard to hear the truth out of their mouths. And we see others who are so far on grace, it's hard to believe that they believe anything. And I think Jesus was both and perfectly truth and, and love. And I think this is really, I think, the growth point. If we even step out of individual, just as our culture, I think if we could balance a little bit of truth and a little of grace, and the world might still reject us because none of the truth is palatable, yes. you know, palatable to the yes. world right now. But if you could just balance those two things, but you know, we become afraid. I mean, usually the people that are hardest to love are the people who are closest to us who have hurt us the most. And so we build barriers and walls and and ultimately, I think this is the Christian life is to, to learn to, to abide in the truth, but to live in love. Lena, we have about four minutes. OK, will you, will you share Christ with someone viewing this Zoom? They don't know why they stopped here. Right. They're about to find out. Hataya, Jesus is, of course, he's the son of God. He's God made flesh. So he was all God, all man. Uh, live the perfect life. These are just the facts about Jesus. And I think it's pretty set. Some people say he never lived. That's not historically true. So live the perfect life for 30 years. At 30 years of age, he started his public ministry where he was going around Israel doing uh, miracles and and uh, doing things that, that only God could do. And people loved him for the longest time. And at the end of the third year, they turned on him. And at that point, the religious leaders wanted to kill him. The interesting thing of the story of Jesus is that uh, he wasn't surprised by that. In fact, he predicted that he would be killed and he tried to warn his disciples. There were 12 men that he would travel with him that were his disciples. And, and it wasn't even a warning. It was just it's a heads up for them because his whole purpose to come to earth wasn't just to live a good life and, and die. It was to live a good life. It, it was to live a perfect life in order to die a death on the cross. And by the way, the entire Old Testament talks about that coming death on the cross, including Amen. the probably the best Old Testament chapter that talks about it is in Isaiah and walks verse 
perverse how this would happen down the road. Anyway, Jesus knew that and he knew he would lay down his life, his perfect life for the sins of the world and told the people who were listening. But of course, we have a hard time listening until we live through something. And so he died on the cross and he had also told them that three days later he would rise again. And because the leaders knew that he had said that, they guarded the tomb. They made sure that nobody would, would be able to free him. And of course, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead because he's God. And, and in that death and resurrection, because he was perfect, he was able to pay the price for our sins, to cover for our sins so that it was almost like a legal contract to where Anyone who would put their trust in that. So all of us are born sinners. All, I, I, don't, I don't need to convince people of that anymore, Rick. I can tell you that every one of us knows we're sinners. And it, it's it's now the question isn't, are, am I a sinner? But what am I going to do with my sin? And most people think, well, if I am just good enough, it'll outweigh the bad. But that doesn't work with a perfect God. And so when you realize the depth of your sinfulness and your inability to save yourself, a price has to be paid for sin in order to approach a holy God. And that's what Jesus did on the cross because he lived humanly a perfect life, even yes. though he was God, because he lived a perfect life and humanly was able to die for our sins. He That death became the atonement, the price, the payment for our sin. So that now, if you receive that payment for your sin, it's not that you've been, God overlooks our sin. It's not that God's like, yeah, you know, I like you now because you received my son. No, it's that the price, the payment has been paid for our sin. And in receiving that, the exchange is that Jesus gives us his perfect righteousness so that now we have perfect access to God, the father who loves us so much, even though he knows us so, so well. That's the story of the gospel. And if you receive Jesus today, if you just tell him, I, I know I'm a sinner. I need somebody. I need a way out of my sin. If you would just put your trust in the death of Jesus on the cross, you will be saved. Amen. Lena, that was, that was so great. I squeezed you're, it in four you're, minutes. You're, you're an articulate writer, and I personally want to recommend this for every one of our viewers. You've had information exactly how to reach her, how to get your copy, everything you need in order to read this book on your own. But let me tell you something. I love this book, but this is the Word of God, the greatest Amen. book ever written. 66 books right here. I read it every year, have for over 30 years. It will change your life. What Lena just said, that plan of salvation, his death, his burial, his resurrection, he's at the right hand of the Father interceding for you okay. right now. Trust him. I tell you, I've trusted him in 1958 at a Christian college. He changed my life. He'll do the same for you. Thank you for watching today. Lena, you have blessed us. Keep writing. Keep doing what you're doing. And they're going to find out how they can help your organization in Beirut, Lebanon. God bless you. Have a great day, all you folks that are watching. Bye-bye.